Hello ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be taking a look at the very first collaboration between Tim Burton and Johnny Depp, good old Edward Scissorhands. 10 things you may or may not know about Edward Scissorhands. 10. The movie exists in part due to Diane Wyest. Diane Wyest plays the always happy Avon selling suburban mother of Kim Peg Boggs. She was the first person to actually read Tim Burton's and Caroline Thompson's original script. Once she finished the script, she became one of his champions and wanted to get the film made and a star in it. Due to this, Tim Burton made sure that Diane was one of the first cast members in the movie. For an extra fact, the character Diane plays Peg Boggs was actually based on the screenwriter's own mother. Caroline Thompson's mother used to bring home strangers and have them live with them for a short amount of time. 9. The screenwriter thought it was the stupidest idea she'd ever heard. Caroline Thompson first met Tim Burton at a studio party, where they bonded over feeling like nerdy outcasts in Hollywood. Thompson came to me at this party as she recently wrote a book which she sold the movie rights to, to Penelope Spheres the director of the hit Mike Myers movie, Wayne's World. With befriending Burton, the pair started a filmmaking journey that would include Scissorhands, The Nightmare Before Christmas and Corpse Bride. Burton read the book to which it had the psychological elements that he wanted to showcase in Edward Scissorhands, so he hired Thompson to write the script on spec. When Burton told her the idea, she thought it was the stupidest thing she'd ever heard of. Speaking with Insider, it's brilliant. There is no struggling for understanding what that means. It's right there on its sleeve. If I can't understand a movie with the sound, it's not worth watching. Movies are movies, not words. What could be more clear than the guy with a set of scissors for hands not being able to fit in? 8. Depp was not the first choice for the role of Edward. When the movie went into pre-production and the cast was being chosen, a variety of actors were considered and even offered to portray Edwards. Among those actors was Gary Oldman, who turned down the role due to him not understanding the movie. In 2016, on an appearance of Larry King, Oldman said, I read the script and I went, <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's a castle at the end of this road, and then an Avon lady comes around selling makeup, and this kid's got scissors hands. This is this is nuts. I don't get this at all. And I go and see the movie, and the camera pans over these multicolored houses in this very sort of suburban neighborhood, and then you see the sort of Dracula castle on the hill. Literally two minutes in, I went, yeah, I get it. Robert Downey Jr., William Hurt, and Jim Carrey were also considered. For two of the most bizarre casting choices, Fox insisted that Tim Burton meet with Tom Cruise and discuss the role. Fox wanted Cruise due to his name being bigger than anyone at that time. Burton obliged and met with Tom Cruise. Years later, Burton told an interviewer, He certainly wasn't my ideal, but I talked to him. He was interesting, but I think it worked out for the best. A lot of questions came up. What were those questions I hear you ask? Well, according to Thompson, in his interview with Tim, he asked how Edward went to the bathroom. If you start asking those questions, the whole thing falls apart. You've missed the metaphor. You've missed the point. Another thing that Cruz wanted was a happier ending. For the second bizarre casting, Michael Jackson lobbied very hard for the role strongly to which Burton reportedly wouldn't return his calls. When Thompson was writing the script, in her mind she had John Cusack as Edward and Laura Dern for Kim. It wasn't until Winona Ryder was cast as Kim, the sole choice of Burton, that Johnny Depp was even brought into the mix. Ryder and Depp were a couple at the time and she was the one who pushed for Depp to meet with Burton. When Burton met with him, he was looked upon as a handsome leading man, to which Burton is quoted, I don't think he felt that way. That's why he wanted to do Edward Scissorhands. He understood that thing of being perceived as one thing and being something completely else. 7. Depp nearly worked himself to death. 
When Depp first read the script, he fell in love with it, going as far as saying it was one of the most beautiful things he's ever read. He became very passionate about the movie and the role, to which he lost over £25 and even refused any cooling agent in the all leather costume. The movie was made in Lutz, South Florida from March 26 to mid July of 1990. The temperature was so high due to the time of year that Depp suffered from severe heat exhaustion and collapsed while filming. Thompson told Insider he was wearing this leather suit, a very hot costume in extreme heat in southern Florida in springtime. They had some kind of cooling agent they could use inside the suit, but I don't think he ever used it. He was really trooper beyond trooper. Tim fainted and he wasn't wearing a hot leather suit. What makes this bit of trivia even more surreal is that Johnny Depp only says 169 words in the entirety of the movie. 6. The movie was originally going to be a musical. When Thompson finished the first draft of the script, it was actually a musical, as this is what Tim Burton planned for the story to be, claiming, it seemed big and operatic to me. Burton's previous partner, Helena Bonham Carter, she has said that he hates musicals. If you ask him, he might mention that he loved the 1955 Guys and Dolls, but people singing is campy by nature, to which he isn't a fan of camp. Thompson told Insider, Tim thought it should be a musical because he thought surrealty was more acceptable if you were a musical, so I wrote lyrics for a song. One song I do remember was called I Can't Handle It. However, the idea for it being a musical was scrapped. Tim read the lyrics and said, I don't think we need to do a musical, the story has enough presence to handle not being a musical. 5. The role of the inventor was written specifically for Vincent Price. Vincent Price is a legend in the horror genre, starring in such iconic movies and TV shows such as House on Haunted Hill, House of Wax, and he even starred as Egghead in a 1967 episode of Batman, sharing the screen with Batman icon Adam West. He was also one of Burton's personal heroes. Growing up, Burton idolised Price and even made a short movie when he was an artist at Disney. He was able to get Price to narrate the short film, to which Price is quoted as saying, It was the most gratifying thing that ever happened. It was immortality. Better than a star on Hollywood Boulevard. Sadly, Vincent Price's health declined and his role was drastically reduced. What was supposed to be a very large role and a significant character was reduced down to only a couple of scenes. Price would sadly pass away three years later due to emphysema and Parkinson's disease. The inventor was his last on-screen role. 4. Hidden Details Throughout the movie, Burton and his production team put numerous visuals on screen to match with the story and Burton's style. One of the most shocking visuals is Edward's hands, made by the legendary special effects wizard Stan Winston. When he was handed the script, he started researching every type of scissors and shears that he could find for the character. The end result is stunning. Each finger is a different type of blade, making each finger unique from the others. When Burton saw them, he originally didn't think he'd actually have scissors for fingers. I thought they'd just be long sharp pieces of metal that weren't finished, but this is much better. Another detail that makes it into the movie is the eerie looking statue that Peg notices when she enters the mansion. The statue is actually an early design for the Oogie Boogie character from The Nightmare Before Christmas. When Peg is driving up to the castle, if you look closely at the sky, one of the clouds is actually shaped like scissors. This was just something that the matter artist thought would be funny to include. Another fantastic detail is the shrewbery that Edward cuts up in the gardens. Disappointingly, these were in fact fake. Production designer Bo Welsh designed and made the animals in the art department. Speaking with the Huffington Post, they are lightweight steel armatures wrapped with chicken wire and stuffed artificial greens. They were light enough to move around. We said, okay, how about one is a dinosaur? One is a turtle? They tended to be fantastical animals. These wonderfully sculptured designs have a permanent home at the upscale New York restaurant Tavern on the Green. 3. Winona Ryder's character Ryder plays Kim, the daughter of Peg, the Avon lady who brings Edward home one night. The role of Kim was written specifically for Ryder, even though Thompson had Laura Dern in her mind's eye for the role. 
Burton asked Thompson to make Kim the popular high school cheerleader with blonde hair, the complete opposite to the real life Winona Ryder. During an interview, Burton said the following, I thought the idea of her as a cheerleader wearing a blonde wig was very funny. I think she might even say it's probably the most difficult thing she's ever done because she did not relate to her character. She was bullied by these people at school herself. It was so funny, I used to laugh every day when I saw her walk onto the set. Wearing this little cheerleader outfit and a Hayley Mills type blonde wig, she looked like Bambi. The above quote by Burton stating that she was bullied in school by these type of people is actually correct. During an interview in the future, Ryder said, I was bullied in high school and I felt comfortable in boys clothing and had to face the unfortunate consequences because of it. I was kicked a lot in the bathrooms. Years later, I went to a coffee shop in Petaluma and I ran into one of the girls who'd kicked me. She said, Winona, Winona, can I have your autograph? I asked her, do you remember me? I went to Kenilworth. Remember how in seventh grade you beat up that kid? She replied with, kind of. And I said, that was me. Go F yourself. Two, the neighborhood that the movie is set in is real. When the movie was in pre-production, Burbank, California was considered as a possible location for the neighborhood. Burton grew up in the area and thought that it had changed too much since he was a child. The small town of Lutz in the Tampa Bay area of Florida was chosen for the three month shoot. The houses were all occupied and being lived in, to which the studio paid for them to be put up in the hotels at Disney World for the filming months. For the look of the movie, the studio asked the homeowners if they could paint their homes, to which it was granted. Bo Welsh, the production designer, had the idea to paint them one of four colours, which Welsh described them as seafoam green, dirty flesh, butter and dirty blue. The window sizes were also reduced to make them look a little more paranoid. The neighbourhood does have the paranoid nosy neighbour peeking from behind the curtain vibe, with the house colours making it look like a pastel painting that would not be out of place in the Pixar movie. 1. Edward Scissorhands The Dance Version After Burton and Thompson decided against turning the screenplay into a musical, opting for the dark fantasy that we all love and know, the movie was in fact turned into a dance in 2005. A quite successful one at that, with tours that spanned Asia, the United States, Australia and of course Great Britain where it was developed. The dance is set in the 50s, a far cry from the late 80s setting of the movie, along with the scriptwriter Thompson and Danny Elfman who scored the movie's soundtrack, both helped with the development. The story is told entirely through music and dance, with no discourse, although the plot is similar to the movie. The show ran for 11 weeks in London, where it was shown at the Sadler's Wealth Theatre and then ventured onto a 14 week tour of the United Kingdom. After a short stint in Asia, it's made its debut in the United States on the 14th of November in San Francisco. It ran from November until spring of 2007 in the US, by the time it played in Brooklyn, it had played over a dozen American cities. It then went and debuted in Australia at the Sydney Opera House in May of 2008. What a debut to have for a dance that was inspired by a movie that Hollywood thought was a stupid idea. So there we have it ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you may or may not know some of those facts when I was looking at them up, I was actually really surprised to find a few things I didn't actually know happened, especially that, well, people in Hollywood thought it was a stupid idea. Thank you ever so much for watching. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe, hit the notification bell for future updates, and I'll see you all very soon.